who I've known since 1983, and who married Dale and I, and, um, and I've seen her through her many incarnations. And, you know, you have people who hold your history, and we hold each other's history. And so, while I was down in Vancouver, becoming even more Unitarian, Dina was down in Spokane, becoming more Unitarian. <laughs> Dina Romoff uh, of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane um, was born Jewish, but she could not reconcile the lack of female heroines in the Old Testament. <laughs> or the idea of an exclusive, elusive God way up in the sky. She needed something more tangible and believable. Discovering witchcraft in the early 1980s, she found her spiritual home within Wicca and continues to be a practitioner of both. It was easy for Dina to join the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane as being a UUer does not mean giving up her Jewish heritage nor her love and practice of Wicca. I give you Dina Roma. Hi. Hi. I guess I'm supposed to use this somehow. Uh, okay, we got it. All right. Everybody can hear pretty well? Yes, thank you. So I'm, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. I have uh, just last, two weeks ago, I think I was in Olympia and went to the UU uh, church there in Olympia. And besides that, and coming here, those the three times I, you know, the three different congregations that I've been in, so it's really wonderful to see how differently everybody does it. Because I, you know, you go to one synagogue, you go to the other, it's all the same. And mostly, you know. So, I want to do a bit of a disclaimer. <clears throat> I don't <clears throat> feel totally prepared. <laughs> As I said, I have uh, my daughter's very ill. I've spent uh, most of the month in Olympia with her. And um, <clears throat> so, I'm just going to wing it. And for the most part, I am a storyteller. So that's pretty much how I'm going to do this. So I was born in the Bronx, uh, which is New York City, if people don't know that. OK. All right. Is that OK? So um, I was born in the Bronx. Um, my uh, parents are from the Ukraine, my grandparents. I don't know how far back that goes because Jews during the diaspora went all over. And um, my grandparents were uh, of the upper class when they were there. And I think it's very much uh, that they didn't really practice Judaism as such. You know, Jews know they're Jews. I don't know how we know we're Jews. We just know we're Jews. I think it's because we all came from little shtetl areas, little communities. And so you knew everybody in the community. And because we were persecuted so much, it's like, who wants to be a Jew who didn't have to be a Jew, you know? So, um, so they, uh, so I don't think Judaism played a big part for them. And, um, and I also relate it, and this is all my, kind of my own putting together, not so much that I heard stories from them because they didn't tell me much. And um, it's like the Jews in Germany, that they, they identified more as Germans. And it was only when, um, when Hitler started clenching down on different rights that they kind of uh, band together and the Jewish culture really flourished. 
But for the most part, they were Germans. They felt themselves German. So I think that was pretty much with my, with my grandparents. So I, I knew I was Jewish, but we didn't do anything Jewish. You know, we didn't go to synagogue. We didn't, but we didn't do Christmas, and we didn't do any of those things. But I knew I was Jewish. And my family broke apart, and my parents uh, had died by the time I was eight and a half, and I went to a Jewish orphanage. And that was my first exposure to really being Jewish. And, um, and what I loved about it was singing. It was all the songs and the melodies, and it was just, that was the best part of it. And a lot of it, didn't register with me. I didn't connect, you know, as I said in that, and Marcia said, I couldn't identify with God. You know, it wasn't happening here. My life was pretty much on a survival basis. And if God wasn't in front of me, it didn't exist. Um, but I identified it was nice having other Jewish people around. Uh, it was nice having that community. It was nice having that ritual every Friday and Saturday of being together, of singing together, of having something in common. And um, when I was uh, 21 and a half, I had uh, by then a set of twins that were a year and a half old. And um, um, I met a fellow in northern Minnesota who, my goodness, he was the only Jew anywhere, and he and I got together, and we were partners for 13 years. And he grew up Jewish. He knows the history. He knows the whole thing. And he, right now, is a Reconstructionist. And uh, I'll give you a very brief thing. There's ultra-Orthodox, which is ultra anything, you know, they're the extremists. And then there's orthodox, and then there's reform, conservative, and, uh, what's after conservative, reform? Well, it's conservative. And, and then they have what's called reconstructionists. And reconstructionists, uh, reconstructionist Judaism is, uh, is where they, take the religion and make it relevant to now, to what's going on in the world now, what's going on socially now. It's not the Orthodox, which is still doing all the old stuff and interpreting the Bible, you know, the Old Testament literally, you know, all those things. So, so if I was gonna put my Jewish face forward, I'd be a Reconstructionist. So that's where that end goes. So I met Evan and I learned quite a bit about Judaism. And I learned to love some of the rituals and some of the um, things that they celebrated. Um, I love Passover, it's still my favorite holiday. I've reinterpreted the Passover. Is anybody Jewish here? So I reinterpreted the uh, Jewish Passover Seder, which is the retelling of the story of the Jews leaving Egypt when they were slaves and becoming free people. And uh, for years we had a Passover Seder that uh, we ate uh, rice and fish to uh, identify with the Vietnam, Vietnamese during their efforts to, you know, remain a free country. And um, Evan worked at an all-women's Catholic college, so we did that with all nuns and priests. That was our <laughs> group that year for Seder. And, um, and then when I came out as a lesbian, I rewrote the Seder as a, a, a feminist lesbian liberation Seder. And uh, my friends, whether they're of any persuasion, love coming to that Seder. It's kind of the big thing in Spokane and 
Um, and we have a few men that come. And, you know, it, it pertains to anybody who wants to uh, free themselves from the bonds that tie them to old beliefs or old patterns in their life. So I learned to love Judaism, but I still had no connection to the religious piece of Judaism. So life goes on, and uh, because Evan was Jewish, and uh, my son was bar mitzvah, he went to Hebrew school, he's the exceller, the uh, academic exceller, and my daughter, his twin, is the psychic exceller. She's a very gifted psychic and sensitive and all of that. So he got bar mitzvahed, and of course I had many run-ins with the rabbi with, in our conservative uh, congregation in Spokane, because at that time we were a conservative group. And it was just right at the time when things were changing in the Jewish religion and women were getting to have more responsibility in the congregations and are, were able, they were starting to become rabbis and they, women were allowed to get up on the bima, which is the pulpit, and, you know, touch the Torah. You know, and all these kind of things that have been very spooky for Jewish women. Because Jewish women, in the old days, they sat in the balcony and gossiped, probably. But they sat in the balcony, they didn't have, and all the men were down on the knee, dobbing and dobbing for hours and hours, praying and praying. And they were up there, and they were totally out of the whole religious <coughs> part of uh, celebrating Judaism. So, so I had a lot of run-ins with the uh, rabbi there. And, you know, my ignorance was that... I didn't really understand all those divisions of, you know, orthodox, reformed, conservative, you know, and on down the line, and uh, that we were we were a mix of an orthodox and a conservative congregation in Spokane that came together and built the temple together, and that the orthodox, you know, couldn't fathom the idea of having women. You know, just even sitting with women, I think, was a challenge for them. But even the conservatives were having uh, some difficulty. So I was kind of pushing the envelope in areas that this congregation and this rabbi were uncomfortable with. And um, at one point he said, you don't have to shove it down our throats. That's what he said to me. And years later, I realized, yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to do because I didn't have a clear understanding of the uh, religious and political makeup of the temple. Anyway, so that's what happened there. Anyway, a side note is last year, uh, Temple Beth Shalom in Spokane voted in a lesbian rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> so with that vote, the whole congregation went reformed. <laughs> so, you know, my son was bar mitzvah 40, 37 years ago. So I was a little bit before my time. But, so now it is a reformed congregation. So, um, I was minimally involved with the temple up there. Um, partly I had very uh, different views than most of them. I had come from a commune, and people would ask me things like, well, did you live in a tent? And I would say, well, the Jews lived in tents for 40 years. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> so I never really kind of clicked with them. I never clicked with the uh, uh, conservative nature of the temples. But I participated because that's what my family was doing. And uh, during that time, so that might have been the 80s, is when the women's movement started blossoming. 
And in Spokane, I got involved with a group of women and we started producing women's music because women were not being represented in the music industry. It was men. And um, we brought uh, Holly Near, we brought Meg Christian. Meg Christian, we brought Farron, we brought on and on, the San Francisco Dance Brigade, we brought What's your name? Something small. Judy Small. We brought Del Ray, who I love. Del. We brought. We just did a lot of women's production, and so here I am hanging out with a lot of women, and um, and I fell in love with women. I just was so impressed with what they were doing and how they were uh, that they were really the change agents in the 80s. That they, uh, there was this energy and this pride that was coming up. And uh, they were getting uh, disgusted with being little quiet homemakers. And, and all the things were happening in the States about the ERA and um, child abuse and domestic violence and you know all of the things that have been so kind of hush 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 for so long and I just uh, decided that um, you know there's always been these two different I used to go speak at the uh, School of Social Work on uh, my experiences coming out and we had a panel and uh, some of the people on the panel knew that they were lesbian and gay the minute they were born, you know, or when they were seven or eight. They just, they had this sense that that was their preference in the world. And, uh, and I kind of, again, was the oddball that I had chosen to be a lesbian. This is something I wanted to do, like you choose to have a political issue that you're involved with or whatever. I decided that um, I loved women, I loved what they were doing, I wanted to support them, I wanted to be with them. Um, and it just made a lot of sense to me, politically and emotionally. And what was going on in the States was that they were trying to get uh, civil rights for gays and lesbians at the time, and they were trying to you know, so I, when I would say what I felt, I would always go, well, no, don't say that. Because their issue was that the gay and lesbian community is like the black community. They don't have a choice about who they are. And therefore, they should be given civil rights. Where I'm saying, I had a choice. And I think many women have had a choice. I think we all have a choice. Uh, Alex Dobkins, who is like the mother of lesbian music, once said, wrote a song that said, every woman can be a lesbian, and she wrote this whole song about that. So, um, so I got very involved with women, and what came out of all of that is women's spirituality, is understanding that uh, before Catholicism before, what was before Catholicism? Judaism. Well, there was, yeah. <laughs> Judaism was the first mono, was the first monotheistic religion. So, so Jews were originally pagans. Has anybody read The Red Tent? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they talked about that. And Dina, which is a, a biblical name, I think was one of the main characters in in that book, and um, and they had statues, and they had you know they had all different goddesses and gods possibly. I don't remember see, I'm having tunnel vision a little, and um, <laughs> and uh, and at some point. You know, when Moses went up on the mountain, now you remember the Ten Commandments with, uh, 
what was his name? Charleston Heston. Charleston Heston. <laughs> you know, he went up on the mountain, he came down, and they had built a golden calf because they were, they were scared. He was gone too long, and they were scared about being in the, in the desert, and um, so they reverted back to their idol worshiping, and of course God said, thou will not have any other gods before thee, and so Moses came down, and he smashed the Ten Commandments and was very pissed off. <laughs> People going to where familiarity and comfort was for them. So, uh, where am I? So, <laughs> oh, right, thank you. So, um, so, God of spirituality made a lot of sense to me. And what I learned there was that um, before this monotheistic religion started sprouting up, that there were thousands of God, they, the goddess went by thousands of names, that she ruled the world in, in, in most of the known world at that time, which yes. was, <laughs> yes. And yes. she went by a thousand names, and there's a wonderful fellow who died recently, Charlie Murphy, who was with a group called Rumors of the Blue Wave, and he wrote a song called The Burning Times, about the witch burnings, and uh, the chorus, which many people know, they don't know the song, but it, Isis is Starda Diana, Hecate Demeter Kali Inanna, well, that's only a few of the names that the goddess has gone under. That's a wonderful, if anybody wants that, it's a beautiful song, it just tells the history of the, of the burning times. And, um, and that there were thousands of goddesses all over, you know, in China and Middle East, and that Isis, the goddess Isis, and if you look up the goddess Isis in your dictionary, she is relegated to the wife of Osiris. They have like a line or two about it, but basically her big claim to fame was that she was the wife of Osiris, whoever he was. Okay? <laughs> anyway, uh, Isis. Isis, at the time, had a larger following than Jesus has now. I mean, she ruled the world. Uh, ruled, you know. They say the goddess, the goddess does not rule the world, the goddess is the world. So she was the world, she was the known world for thousands of years. You know, longer than Jesus has been around in our consciousness. And, you know, it's like, wow, where did that go? So, you know, there just was this whole many years of learning what happened and, and about the witch burnings and about, um, you know, this whole annihilation of a, of a, a group of people because they believed in the cycles of life because they believed that women were uh, sacred because they bled and didn't die, because they gave birth to life, they created life, and at that time they didn't know the science behind the whole thing, so they were the, they were the big kahunas there, because they had, you know, and they were community makers, and they, developed science and math and agriculture and all these things that have, you know, that we are now. So I, uh, we started a coven and we had a group for 13 years and uh, we were called uh, uh, Daughters Rising and um, it was a wonderful learning experience. It was set up very much like your group here is, that uh, each month or week or whatever, whenever we met, there was a new leader, a new priestess that would lead the ceremony, who would have ideas about, uh, you know, 
what we were gonna focus on and a lot of it was seasonally run, you know, the, you know, whether it was full moon or solstice or the cross quarters, Beltane or Condomas or whatever it was. And we did a lot of art, we did a lot of traveling. We, we just had this wonderful goddess group. And um, with everything, everything that came to me and through me, I kind of would put together into this uh, identity of who I was, how I identified myself. So, uh, you know, from being a Jew, it grew to being a Jewish lesbian, being a Jewish lesbian, it grew to being a Jewish lesbian witch, and, you know, it just kind of kept growing. And I um, no longer saw, my, saw myself as one, one identity, one, one dimensional. So uh, my group kind of disbanded. We still kind of get together for different holidays, different Serum Passover, and you know, uh, usually winter solstice and summer uh, equinox. Spring equinox. Spring equinox and uh, summer solstice. And, um, and I, Having, um, you know, some of my history is I went into a Jewish orphanage when I was eight, uh, and I loved it there. I loved it. I would do it all these kids, and we played, and we had a good time. We went to school, and we came back, and we, you know, and I just loved being there. And after, and then I went into a foster home, a Jewish foster home. But I didn't have any religious training while I was there, but my foster parents were uh, Jewish and we did Passover, you know, all the kind of same things. And my foster mother kept kosher. I don't know if people know what kosher is, but you have to keep all your, you have two sets of dishes, you have two sets of pots and pans, you have two sets of, of cloths to dry the dishes. You have, I mean, it's just tedious. And I was always mixing things up and I was really a bad Jew. There, and I bring trefa dick, which is non-kosher food in the house when my foster parents weren't home. And I thought I was getting away with things, but she knew everything, because Jews are psychic. And, um, and um, I see, I get off on a tangent. How did you become a Unitarian? What? How did you become a Unitarian? Well, I'll tell you, so there we go. So, thank you. Um, I've had a traumatic brain injury. I'm almost 70, and my daughter's ill, so I, uh, okay. keeping yeah. track, so forgiven. I'm forgiven, thank yeah. you. So, so my group broke up, and I was looking for community, and then I lived on communes, that was the other thing. I went into the whole communal scene, so I lived on a commune in northern Minnesota for a while. I had, one of my kids were, infants and I lived in the loft of the barn that was insulated with straw and cardboard and 40 below. Winter on Christmas it was 40 below. And then I lived on one uh, for four years outside of Davenport, uh, which is 30 miles from Spokane at the bottom of a canyon. It's called Tolstoy Farm and Tolstoy Farm is still around. It's the oldest non-religious community in the country. It has no charismatic leader, it has no religious philosophy. You just go there and anarchy reigns. <laughs> and you get to experiment with who you want to be in the world and how you, you know, with different ideas of whatever it was, you know, building a house or having a spiritual philosophy or whatever it was. It was just free reign there. So. I really had a personal need for community. And so when, um, when my group broke up, and particularly after my partner of 21 years left, I needed to find some place to settle. I needed, I felt very alone and, um, disjointed and floundering 
because your bottom falls out with, with all these different kind of things happening in my life. So I don't know how I got up to the Unitarians, but I went up there and uh, for a year I sat in the back and cried pretty much. And didn't, I knew maybe one or two people from the outside world a little bit. And, and then, you know, as my grief subsided and all of that, I could little by little kind of like, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, and listen to their philosophy and uh, kind of get a sense of who the Unitarians were. And um, they are incredibly like Wicca. I mean, the, the whole philosophy is very much the same. And I see that Marsha put on this paper here, you know, the principles. And I brought... But there, uh, that's the, the, the Universalist principles, and they um, are put out of Boston, but they are given the little cards. Like, we're going to get our cards from the UU communitarians here in Canada. And... Uh, Brought her cards from yeah, I'm passing them around. So um, we believe in the freedom of religious expression. Beautiful. Why not? That includes me, right? I have four or five. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's me. All individuals should be encouraged to develop their own personal theologies, right? and to present openly their religious opinions, and I'm very opinionated, right? Without fear or censors, censure or reprisal. Now, that is, that goes with a lot of things. Now, um, what I learned about Judaism, which fits into my philosophy now, is um, Jews were social change agents. You know, they believe in Tikkun, and Tikkun is the healing and repair of the world. And that as the chosen people, it was our responsibility to bring uh, the essence, the teachings of God to earth. So, to heal the world. To heal the world. And so, you know, I connected on that one. Uh, we believe in the authority of reason and conscience. And so, I'm a child of the 60s. I went through the anti-war stuff. I went through the women's movement, the, the whole thing. And, um, you know, I've been an activist most of my life. And so, that spoke to me, right? There we go. There's no document or an official hoo-hoo and personal choice. You know, it, it's like all the good things, all the good things. And one thing that I, that I learned, and um, my past partner who became a speech language pathologist would, would every once in a while say, you know, Dina, I think you have a learning disability. Because it takes me a long time to kind of put pieces together, and then it's like this, the big bang. And what I realized was that, and I, I think I realized that through the study of the goddess, is that it's mythology, it's myths, it's stories. And the part that I couldn't identify with are those people that make it true. This is the truth. You know, God's up there, and God is watching you. And when you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. And that, that, and there are people that do totally and ultimately believe that as their truth, and that has become okay. But what I realize is that most of these stories, and even the goddess stuff, is mythology to stories to try to understand our place in the world and, and, and what's, what's birth and what's death and what are we supposed to be doing here and what's our purpose and all of those. And so once I got that, um, that understanding, 
the whole concept of God made it much more tolerable. Toler I had more tolerance for people who had those beliefs on, on wherever they landed up on the spectrum. And I have, I was telling, I think, Marsha the other day, I have a, an aunt who she's met, a foster aunt who is 91 years old. And she uh, was brought up as Yiddishkeit. And what that means is her parents came from Europe, and they were from Poland, and they were communists. So they were Jewish communists. So you don't practice religion, but they had Jewish culture, they had Yiddish culture, they had Yiddish food, they had Yiddish, her first language was Yiddish. <clears throat> but she was brought up without religion. And then she, she always tells a funny story. And they lived in the Shola Malechem houses, they were called, in the Bronx. And it was a big uh, uh, project that had all the Jews from Europe there, all these communist Jews. And she said she was 14 years old before she realized she was going to commie camp every summer. <laughs> and, uh, so, so what she said to me was, when I was having a conversation with her about my difficulty with believing in God, she says people have it backwards. They believe uh, God is love and God is peace, and God is justice. And what it really is, is love is God, and peace is God, and justice is God. And, and it, 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 again, it, it gives me chills to, to hear that. And, and, you know, it's an interpretation, but it's one that when I hear someone talking about God, that comes into my head as, um, love is God and peace is God and you know I, I hear it differently and I'm not as prickly about them talking about God because that can be also my understanding of God so anyway onward here we believe in the unity of experience there is no fundamental conflict between faith and knowledge right religion and the world the sacred and the secular so all the the, the things here just really spoke to me. And um, so the next piece of it was uh, really uh, getting back to my activist roots from the 60s. So, you know, I was arrested a few times uh, with sit-ins for the anti-war movement and this and that. And, um, I realized that I had been fetching for many years. You know what fetching? Anybody doesn't know what fetching means? No. To fetch, it means to complain. Fetching, it's a nice Yiddish word. And about global warming. And nobody's been, nobody talks about global warming. What is going on here? And then we have this whole election thing that goes on for a year. and. <clears throat> and they're not talking very much about global warming. And I'm panicking, um, you know, with who cares who's president if we don't have a world. Oh, I've been talking that long? Oh, pretty good. Great. So, um, so um, I was somewhere and I picked up a piece of paper and it said direct action spoke at a meeting and this and that and I thought <laughs> I don't even know what it is I went and it was a group that was organizing to uh, stop the trains coming through Spokane Spokane trains come right through downtown uh, 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 there was recently outside of Lacey a oil train that went off the tracks blew up fortunately it was outside of town it did a big grand job of contamination, you know, whatever, but it wasn't in the city, it didn't kill anybody, those things. And here we are with our trains coming right through the downtown area of Spokane. If there was a, an issue with the trains, it would absolutely be horrific. So, <clears throat> someone said, you want to sit on the railroad tracks? You want to go to Washington? You want to sit on the railroad tracks? I'll, I'll do it. That's me. I'll, I'll do it. So three of us went and we, we represented the raging grannies. 
because we were pissed off. And there is a, a group nationwide called the Raging Grannies. Here too. And here too, right. And so I dressed up, I put on a babushka on my head. I had my grandmother's wrap around apron. They had some beautiful, you know, old 1930s stuff on and aprons with their grandchildren, pictures of their grandchildren. And we got there and we had this old wheelchair and we had an old, um, <clears throat> lawn chair and we get to the site and nobody else is there we go first and we're schlepping over there and with our wheelchair and there happened to be a worker in a truck by the railroad tracks and he jumps out of the car and he comes over and he said um can i help you ladies across the tracks and i, <laughs> and I said we're not going across the tracks and he says well what are you doing and i said we're going on the tracks and he said well, like, be careful, there's a train coming. And I said, well, you better get on the intercom and tell it to stop because we're gonna be on the track. So in 20 minutes, you know, our group came, which it was only about 15 people. We had signs, we had this and that. The police did overkill. They had, they had, there's a railroad police. I never knew there was a railroad police. And they came and then the city police came and. They arrested us and took us down and booked us and did the whole thing and they got us out of there pretty quick because everybody we came in contact with were going, how do you feel about global warming and how do you think the trade's coming through and then increasing them because all this coal is going and oil is going to China. And so, um, <clears throat> so we have a court case coming up in a month. There were six of us, then we had three veterans for peace, I'll speak up. We had three veterans for peace who did it about six weeks later, and they were arrested also. So we've had the six of us put together in one court case. We have our pretrial on the 19th of May, I believe. We have three expert witnesses coming from around the country because we're doing a necessity plea, which um, uh, saying, we had to do it because nobody, we did all this stuff, wrote letters and picketed and did this and that, and nobody has done anything about it. So uh, we also have put in a lawsuit. We're suing the federal government for taking away our uh, ability to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness by destroying our planet with global warming. So we're on the front lines with that. And how I, does that relate to your spirituality? How do, well, it has to because we're saving the world. It has to do with, um, you know, when people come and ask me what my religion is, I tell them my garden is my religion. You know, it tells me everything I need to know about life. Birth, death, decay, rebirth, all those things. And, that, and so it's an integral part of my spirit, you know, my, my spirit being um, manifest in the world. And so I have brought some political information about our fundraising efforts and about the group that I'm involved with, which is the Committee for Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And they're tr working very hard to make nature a person, because in the United States, uh, corporations are people, which is ridiculous, but we're trying to make nation, uh, uh, nature a person, and they've been uh, very successful in Ecuador, now has rewritten their constitution to make nature a person, They're the first country in the world, and also uh, very recently they worked with India, two municipalities in India that have made the Ganges River and the Yamada River persons. And so now they can deal with uh, cleanup and, and um, any atrocities. Uh, uh, New Zealand has made all beings, all life sentient beings. Yeah, yeah, a big wow. And so we can, you know, because all we've done is exploit everything, exploit people on their little, you know, the ladder of men at the top, black children on the bottom, you know, the whole thing. So, so the last thing I want to show you is, <clears throat> I usually sell the t-shirts at the Gay Pride. 
in Spokane. I have I, somebody else took it over recently, but so every year we have a different T-shirt. And one year there was a T-shirt that said, "I am proud to be," and then people could fill in whatever they were proud to be. So I I usually always wear this T-shirt, and um, and <clears throat> so for a long time it just said, "I am proud to be a Jewish feminist lesbian witch," and then about five or six years ago I added. Unitarian Universalist, and then Marsha remind me, reminded me that I'm an activist, so that was added too. So we are more than one dimensional, yeah. and um, <laughs> I think that we're going to forego the meditation. Um, in uh, aid of uh, some moments of congregational responses. Um, if people have questions, feelings, thoughts that they would like to uh, express either to each other or to, to Dina, um, I, I welcome your comments at this time. I wanted to read this. I have my own. Do I have my own? Yes. It's from Starhawk. She's a, uh, a Jewish psychotherapist, which those are her titles. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned we can only catch glimpses of from time to time, community. Somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means Strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter. A circle of healing, a circle of friends, some place where we can be free. <coughs> Thank you for the wonderful ending. Or momentarily transition. <laughs> so, does anybody, would anybody like to express anything? Yes. Thank you. I think that's lovely. Thank you. To, uh, thank you. I just want to bless our, our offerings and receivings today. Thank you. Thoughts, feelings? Uh, thanks, Dina. I've known you. Dina married me. Uh, how long ago was that? I don't know, 35? 40? 40 years Anyway, she married, she married my, me and my second husband. Um, and I just want to thank you for, for, I didn't know a lot of the history. Um, I also want to ask you, what is Wicca? I do not really know, and I'm curious about how it relates to Unitarianism. Well, Wicca was just the old religion. It was paganism. It kind of mixed with goddess worship. And, um, uh, you know, women were the, the uh, midwives and the uh, herbalists. And, you know, this is all before doctors kind of came on the scene and all of that. And it's just, um, Wicca is, this, is what you want to call kind of the religious practice of uh, or spiritual practice of witches and uh, earth-centered, you know, there's really, to me, there's no god or goddess, it's just um, life, you know, the mystery of life. You know, so that's how I see it. But it has more to do with witchcraft, Wicca, and paganism has more to do with the old, the old um, earth-based, but I mean, they kind of mush together. I just wanted to thank you for uh, giving us your history about how all of these things from a 
secular Jewish upbringing uh, to finding activism and feminism and lesbianism and then finding Wiccan and then a place where you can share all of it. Share all the pieces being in a Unitarian and a social justice framework. And I just, I think it's so neat when we can be who we are, all the layered history that makes us who we are, because everyone has one of those histories, but in some traditions, you're only supposed to be the one thing. But we do have stories where we're layer upon layer and it's all mixed and changed. I myself come from the Anglican tradition and then science is my faith, but I still need a community. And so I've dabbled in Buddhism and Wiccan and now Unitarian because I, I feel a need that we should be able to come together. And as you say, it's not, it's not the God that is love. It is the love that is the God. And I thought that was, that was really moving. So thank you. Yeah, I wanted to thank you as well for, for coming and you what I'm reminded of is that you know there's Unitarians in the United States and in Canada and and that you know you found a place that you were welcome with your array of religious beliefs and, and I'm really grateful that that you're here and part of our growing uh, and our Unitarian congregation is really brand new and but discovering maybe this is where we need to be, and that you, you'd be welcome here, and that we're all welcome here to, mm -hmm. to do that, and the connection mm -hmm. that we have with uh, other Unitarians in our differences, in our, mm -hmm. our own journeys, they are yeah. so different. Thank you. And uh, so thanks for helping us grow and understand who we are, too. You know, there was something on YouTube that was wonderful. It had a group of people that could be as diverse as you can imagine. There were, um, you know, Orthodox this, and you know, extreme that, and bikers, and kids, and the whole thing. And they brought them all together, and they, they, they said, okay, everyone who uh, likes apple pie, come to the middle. <laughs> or everyone who has lost a parent, come to the middle. Or every, anyone who had sex that morning, come to the middle. Or, and, and that people found different ways to connect outside of, you know, this thing that keeps us separate. So. I just want to say, um, with all these uh, exotic titles, I, you look so ordinary. <laughs> I do, I got dressed up. <laughs> Thank you so much, really appreciate it, really appreciate that. But okay. witches can turn into other things. Yes, that's right. <laughs> they change reality uh, as well. Oh, <laughs> I was just wanted to say that I lo like especially that you're taking action to make the world a better place in your way. And I think we can all do that. Even from being invisible, we can pray. Uh, we can pray for peace. There have been people who have organized, you know, lots of people in prayer and it does work. Mm -hmm. We can also pray by ourselves. We can send light. We're all, we don't realize it, but we're all healers. We're all magic. We're all utterly amazing. And if we just envision what we want instead of what we don't want, right. and that's the good thing about Trump. Hopefully he's got all of us knowing what we don't want. Yes, <laughs> and then, very clear. And, that, and then helping us envision what we do want. But I think the one thing we shouldn't do is sit in our house and feel it. it's all doomsday and there's nothing we can do. So I appreciate that you're doing what you can. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and you took the words right out of my mouth, Amanda. <laughs> and um, you were the first person I've met who made a choice to be a lesbian, so thank you. Because in my mind, at least, I don't think I've met somebody who consciously did that. Because most people, I, all people I know are born gay or lesbian. So. 
And there is a group or of otherwise, us. rather, uh, or <laughs> on the yeah. continuum as well. Yeah. A quick ad for Dina. Anytime you go to Spokane, don't forget to go to the church there. We've been yeah, about to the three or four times, oh. and it's a great welcoming. Yeah, place. we also uh, are are streaming now. So if you go to U U C S Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane no. dot org, no U U C. Oh, it's U U Spokane. Yeah. Look up U U Spokane. Okay, look She'll look it up. Dot org. You can, um, we used to have all the minister's sermons uh, written up. A few weeks later it would be there. You could reread them again, which I did a lot because it's a lot to absorb. And it also, you can also do live. Um, you can watch the service as it's happening. Today we're doing a John Denver service, which I'm sad to not be there for. Uh, what did, what, it's uh, UU Spokane. Dot org. You use Spokane.org. And we have a service at 9.15 and we have a service at 11, so you could watch it live. We could also set up a time, if you're going to do it as a group, let's say, where the minister will recognize you and say welcome to our you know, community in Nelson. Can and back too, right? we can yeah. Skype. You can Skype, yeah. You can be there. You can wave to us. We can yeah. wave to you. And uh, you know, have a connection. So, yeah, Dale and I have been, uh, I guess, so maybe four, four times, maybe five, something like that. Mm -hmm. Whenever we are down for the weekend with Dina, um, we'll we'll go, and it's a it's a great, great minister and very interesting topics. Same as in you see. Yes, Einstein. There is a Santa Claus. He scientifically proved Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, we have the offering, and I thank you for, for thanking it. Um, and, oh, we have, we have, um, we have a closing song. Yes. And it is after the closing song. I also have a few things I'll put.